Hi friends, my name is Benjamin, and today I want to tell you another chilling story. Michelle Young was born in 1977 in the vibrant and harmonious city of New York. Possessing an outgoing personality from a young age, she grew up with ambitions of pursuing a career in finance. After completing high school, Michelle took a significant step toward realizing her dream by attending a university in Raleigh. By 2001, she had achieved financial success and during this time crossed paths with a man who would greatly impact her personal life. On her 24th birthday, while celebrating with friends, Michelle encountered Jason Young. Jason, also an alum of the same university, shared a similar academic background and interests with Michelle. This connection led to a romantic relationship, eventually culminating in their marriage. On the 3rd of November 2006, a Friday, Jason Young requested his sister-in-law, Meredith Fisher, to visit his residence and retrieve some eBay printouts. The purpose was to prevent his 29-year-old wife, Michelle Young, from discovering them. Jason informed Meredith that he had printed materials related to coach bags, intending to purchase one for Michelle as an anniversary gift. However, he forgot to put them away and was concerned that Michelle might stumble upon them. At the time, Jason was away on a business trip. Meredith agreed to pick up the printouts and was told they were located in the home office upstairs. Jason, Michelle, and their two-year-old daughter, Cassidy, lived together on Birchleaf Drive in Raleigh, North Carolina, with Michelle being five months pregnant with their second child, a baby boy. Around 1 p.m., Meredith arrived at the house, entering through the broken garage door and then through the unlocked kitchen door. Upon entering, she noticed the house was chilly. Michelle's car was in the garage, and in the kitchen, Meredith found Michelle's purse and keys on the counter. Concerned, she called out Michelle's name, but received no response. Despite hearing Michelle's dog, Mr. G, whimpering, Meredith couldn't locate him and was unsure of his whereabouts. Heading upstairs, Meredith noticed what she initially thought was red hair dye near the top of the staircase. Upon reaching the top, she discovered her sister lying face down on the floor. Contrary to her initial assumption, the red substance was not hair dye, but blood. Michelle had been brutally beaten to death, lying in a pool of blood when Meredith made the grim discovery. Immediately calling 911, Meredith found that Cassidy, Michelle's two-year-old daughter, had been hiding under the covers on the bed and was physically unharmed. Cassidy, asking for band-aids, mentioned that her mother had boo-boos everywhere. While speaking to the operator, Meredith expressed Cassidy's claim that there might be someone else in the house. When questioned about Michelle's issues, Meredith mentioned occasional fights between Michelle and her husband Jason, clarifying that they were not excessively severe. She also informed the operator about the presence of blood footprints throughout the house, including those of Michelle's daughter. Upon the arrival of paramedics, Michelle was confirmed dead and it was evident that she had been deceased for a significant period. Cassidy, Michelle's daughter, was examined, revealing dried blood on her toenails and the bottom of her pajama pants. Fortunately, she had not sustained any physical injuries. Meredith promptly informed her mother, Linda Fisher, about Michelle's tragic death. Linda, in turn, contacted Jason's mother, Pat Young, to relay the devastating news. Meanwhile, Jason was en route from Virginia to Pat's house in Brevard. Upon his arrival, his stepfather broke the news about Michelle. Subsequently, Meredith called Jason, revealing that Michelle's death had been ruled a homicide. Upon learning of his wife's death, Jason, accompanied by some family members, hurriedly drove to Raleigh. During the journey, friends informed him that the police had inquired about any marital problems Michelle might have had. Opting to remain silent until he retained legal representation, Jason declined to answer police questions upon his arrival in Raleigh, citing advice from his counsel. The police discovered traces of blood on the doorknob connecting the kitchen to the garage, later confirming it to be Michelle's blood. Despite a broken garage door which had been in that condition for some time, there was no evident sign of forced entry. Notably, Michelle's jewelry box had two drawers removed, 
and some valuable items, including her wedding and engagement rings, were missing. However, the house was not otherwise disturbed or ransacked. When Michelle's lifeless body was located, she was clad in sweatpants and a zip-up sweatshirt. Her body exhibited signs of discoloration, coldness, and stiffness. The scene revealed a significant amount of her blood, with blood stains on the bedroom walls and inside the closet. Michelle was found adjacent to a closet labeled His Closet, and a small doll was discovered beside her head. The police sought to question Jason regarding his whereabouts on the night of November 2nd and the early hours of November 3rd. Despite reluctance and non-cooperation from Jason, investigators found that on November 2nd, he left Raleigh, heading towards Virginia for a sales call scheduled at 10 a.m. on November 3rd in Clintwood. On the evening of November 2nd, Michelle had plans to spend time with her friend Shelley Shad. According to Shelley, she arrived at Michelle's house around 6.30 p.m., finding Jason still present. When offered to join them for dinner, Jason declined, mentioning his plan to eat at a Cracker Barrel on his way to Galax, Virginia. Jason had booked a room in Galax for the night, intending to stay there before driving to Clintwood the next morning for the sales call. Shelley informed the police that after Jason's departure, Michelle bathed Cassidy and put her to bed, after which they watched Gray's anatomy. During their time together, Michelle confided in Shelley about recent disagreements with Jason, particularly regarding holiday plans. Michelle desired her mother Linda to stay with them from Thanksgiving through Christmas, a proposition that Jason was not enthusiastic about. Investigations revealed that on that night, Jason made seven phone calls to Michelle. Shelley, Michelle's friend, shared with the police her unsettling feeling of being watched that night, prompting her to ask Michelle to accompany her to her car when she left sometime between 10 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. A resident delivering newspapers in the area on the morning of November 3rd, between 3.30 and 4 a.m. reported, seeing a light-colored SUV parked either in Michelle's yard or on the street in front of her house. Another resident was walking by at about 6.15 a.m. and noticed an empty SUV parked at the edge of the driveway. Police investigated Jason's movements, revealing that after leaving his Raleigh residence on November 2nd to travel to Virginia, he stopped at a gas station in Raleigh around 7.30 p.m. Jason drove a white Ford Explorer and contacted his mother, Pat Young, informing her of his intention to check with Michelle about the possibility of staying over at Pat's house on Friday night during his return from the business trip. Pat resided in Brevard, and Jason planned to collect some furniture she wanted to give him. Following his call to his mother, Jason continued his journey to Virginia, stopping for food at a Cracker Barrel restaurant in Greensboro at 9.25 p.m. Later, he checked into a Hampton Inn at 10.54 p.m., using a key card to enter his room at 10.56 p.m., Although he utilized express checkout the next morning, the exact departure time from the hotel remained unconfirmed. A call Jason made to his mother at 7.40 a.m. on November 3rd, using a cell tower near Wytheville, Virginia, placed him in the state. He arrived at the sales call in Clintwood, albeit 30 minutes behind schedule. Despite surveillance footage and the key card indicating that Jason did not leave his hotel room after midnight, police were skeptical. Further analysis of the footage led them to suspect tampering, believing Jason may have driven back to Raleigh after midnight to commit the crime against Michelle and then returned to Virginia. Upon examining the Young's computer, investigators discovered internet searches related to the anatomy of a knockout, head trauma blackout, head blow knockout, and head trauma, though the exact timing of these searches remained undetermined. Two years after Michelle's body was discovered, Jason was charged with first-degree murder and entered a plea of not guilty. The prosecution built its case around the assertion that Jason and Michelle experienced marital and financial difficulties, with Jason allegedly desiring to end the marriage. Multiple affairs were brought to light during the trial as evidence of strained relations. According to the prosecution, after checking into the Hampton Inn in Hillsville, Virginia, they claimed Jason left the hotel during the night, 
returned to Raleigh and committed the murder. They argued that he manipulated the hotel's surveillance camera and made a stop for gas at a station between Hillsville and Raleigh. The prosecution presented to the jury the theory that Michelle was strangled and beaten to death, and her two-year-old daughter Cassidy was left alone in the house with her mother's lifeless body for an extended period. The crime scene revealed Cassidy's small, bloody footprints scattered throughout the residence. During the trial, the jury was presented with surveillance footage from the Hampton Inn, starting from 10.49 p.m. on the 2nd of November. However, the footage went black at 11.20 p.m., leading the prosecution to argue that Jason tampered with the camera. They alleged that he did so to prop open the security door, allowing him to exit without using his key card. A hotel employee discovered that the first floor emergency door, leading from the western stairwell to the exterior of the hotel, was propped open with a small red rock. Normally, this door remained locked between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. Upon further inspection, Keith noticed that the camera in the stairwell closest to the propped open door was not functioning, while the other cameras were operational. The last image captured by that camera was at 11.20 p.m. on the 2nd of November. Although staff members later plugged the camera back in at 5.50 a.m. on the 3rd of November, someone redirected it toward the ceiling between 6.34 a.m. and 6.35 a.m. The prosecution argued that this sequence of events suggested that Jason unplugged the camera and left the door ajar, creating an alibi for himself while he returned home to commit the crime against his wife. The prosecution asserted that Jason made a stop at a gas station in North Carolina around 5 a.m. on his way back to Virginia. The gas attendant testified in court, stating that she believed the person who visited the gas station that morning was Jason. She vividly recalled the encounter, explaining, I don't forget nothing like that when somebody is cussing and fussing at me. According to Gracie's testimony, a man in a white SUV parked at the farthest pump attempted multiple times to pump gas. Frustrated, he entered the store and verbally abused Gracie because the pump wasn't working. She informed him that, at that early hour, customers needed to provide money or identification before activating the gasoline pumps. To resolve the situation, the man handed her $20, pumped $15 worth of gasoline into his vehicle, and promptly drove away without returning to the store for his change. Gracie's account was presented as evidence to support the prosecution's case. During the trial, details of Jason and Michelle's marriage were brought to light. Some acquaintances believed that their union occurred primarily because Michelle became pregnant with their first child. Meredith Fisher, Michelle's sister-in-law, testified that she advised Michelle to leave Jason, but Michelle made no effort to pursue a divorce. Three weeks before Michelle's death, Jason allegedly told a friend that he was done. The court also learned that the couple frequently argued about Michelle's mother, Linda. Linda often visited her daughter for extended periods, expressing a desire to move to North Carolina to spend more time with Michelle and her granddaughter. Linda even offered to renovate their house to accommodate her presence. While Michelle was content with this arrangement, Jason was not. Linda, Michelle's mother, testified in court about the moment she learned of her daughter's death. According to Linda, her other daughter, Meredith, called and spelled out, Mom, Michelle is dead! Linda initially inquired if Michelle had merely passed out, but Meredith confirmed that Michelle was indeed dead. Linda recounted attempting to contact Jason, but her calls went unanswered and he never returned them. Linda's testimony revealed a tumultuous relationship between Jason and Michelle, with Linda witnessing numerous fights and Jason allegedly belittling Michelle. Linda informed the court that she advised Michelle to leave Jason, but Michelle was determined to salvage the marriage. According to Linda, Michelle confided in her that Jason didn't make love to her and had a perverted approach to intimacy. Linda also testified that Jason would have female friends stay over at the house when Michelle was away on business trips. Expressing her sorrow, Linda told the jury, She had so much to offer. There was so much about Michelle that was just... She was an NC State cheerleader. I mean, she had that pep, that energy, that vivacious. You know, she loved life and he took it away from her, 
just took it away from her. After Michelle's funeral, Jason moved into his parents' house with their daughter, Cassidy. Linda hired a lawyer to facilitate visitation with Cassidy, and after legal proceedings, full custody was granted to Meredith. Linda believed that Jason wanted no further questions asked. During the trial, one of Jason's female friends, Carol Ann Sowerby, testified that she had known Jason since their teenage years. She visited him in the fall of 2006, just 10 days before Michelle's death, and admitted to having sexual relations with Jason on the living room couch one night while Michelle was out of town. Carol also claimed that Jason took her wedding ring pretending to swallow it, but returned it the next day. The court also received testimony from another female friend, Michelle Money, who was one of Michelle Young's college sorority sisters. Michelle Money believed that her own husband was unfaithful, and she disclosed that she first met Jason at his wedding. Their contact increased towards the end of September 2006, and Jason visited Michelle Money in Orlando in October of that year, during which they engaged in a sexual relationship. Jason reportedly told a friend that he was in love with Michelle Money. Throughout October, they maintained constant communication, exchanging messages 980 times in one month. The day before Michelle's murder, they were in contact 51 times in a single day. Michelle Money was the last person Jason contacted on the 2nd of November and the first person he called on the morning of the 3rd of November. Michelle Money testified, stating, We would talk regularly about work and life and kids. The court also heard about the severe injuries Michelle sustained. Dr. Thomas Clark, who conducted the autopsy, testified that Michelle died from blunt force trauma to her head, having endured at least 30 blows, with the most serious inflicted by a heavy blunt object featuring a rounded surface causing crescent-shaped skull fractures. Dr. Clark also noted signs of strangulation as Michelle suffered a broken jaw, skull fractures, brain hemorrhaging, lacerations, abrasions, and dislodged teeth. The court was informed that there was no evidence indicating that Jason had previously physically assaulted Michelle. However, the prosecution asserted to the jury that even if this were true, it didn't rule out the possibility that he assaulted her on the specific night in question. Their argument was based on the belief that Jason had the capacity for physical violence, and they brought in his former fiancée, Genevieve Cargol, as a witness. Genevieve attested that she herself had been a victim of domestic violence at Jason's hands. One notable incident she described occurred at a Texas wedding, where Jason, in an intoxicated state, forcibly took off her engagement ring during an argument about his level of intoxication. According to Genevieve, the ring was too small and tight on her finger, and when she couldn't remove it, Jason, agitated, took it off forcefully. She recounted to the court, I had never seen him like that before. His eyes were completely empty and deserted, glazed over as if he wasn't seeing me. Genevieve asserted that the incident mentioned earlier was not an isolated occurrence. She recounted another episode where Jason, in a fit of anger, punched the windshield of her car with his bare hand, causing damage. Additionally, he had punched a wall in their apartment, resulting in further property damage. After several years of no contact, Genevieve received an email from Jason on September 12, 2006, expressing his love for her. The defense contended that the prosecution lacked credible evidence against their client. They highlighted that Jason's DNA and fingerprints were naturally found in the bedroom, but none of his fingerprints were blood-stained. Moreover, there was no blood discovered in his car, on his clothing, or in the Virginia hotel room where he stayed. During the police examination, Jason was found to have no cuts, bruises, or other injuries on his hands or body, except for a bruised and broken toenail. When given the opportunity to testify, Jason admitted that he was not a perfect husband, but claimed to be actively working on improving his marriage. He vehemently denied any involvement in Michelle's murder. The court learned about the existing issues in Jason and Michelle's marriage, but also heard that Jason genuinely loved his wife and was committed to making the relationship succeed. 
Excitement surrounded the impending birth of their baby boy, and emails exchanged on October 24, 2006, indicated Jason's willingness to attend counseling sessions. According to Jason, he didn't believe their arguments were more frequent than those in other couples. The defense contended that Jason wouldn't have had sufficient time to travel back to Raleigh, commit the murder, and return to Virginia, given that the hotel was approximately 160 miles from their home. Jason had recently started a new job involving electronic health record software sales, and he was in Virginia because his employer had scheduled an early morning sales call in Clintwood on November 3rd. To avoid driving from Raleigh on the day of the call, Jason opted to stay overnight. Nervous about the upcoming meeting, he spent the evening reviewing the demonstration software he intended to use during the presentation. In court, Jason stated that he left his hotel room to retrieve his laptop charger from his car, but realized he had left the key card inside. He propped the exit door open, went back to his room, and then left again to smoke a cigar. He also went to the front desk to get a copy of USA Today, propping the exit door open once more for his cigar break. When questioned about being 30 minutes late to his sales call in Clintwood, Jason claimed that he got lost. Regarding the internet searches found on his computer, Jason explained that they were conducted at a different time and were related to an accident he had witnessed. Despite the jury's deliberation, they couldn't reach a unanimous verdict, resulting in a hung jury with an 8-4 to four vote for acquittal. Jason faced a second trial where he didn't testify, but a video of his testimony from the first trial was played. The second jury deliberated for six hours before finding him guilty of first-degree murder. Jason was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Jason appealed his conviction, and during the appeal hearing, his new legal team argued that his trial attorney should have objected more strongly when the judge allowed jurors to hear about Jason's lack of response to a civil wrongful death lawsuit, which found him responsible for his wife's murder. A civil lawsuit had been brought against Jason by Michelle's family between the two criminal trials, and he was deemed responsible for Michelle's death in that civil suit. Jason's attorney contended that the jury should not have been made aware of this information. They also argued that the same judge, Superior Court Judge Donald Stevens, presided over both the civil case and the second criminal trial, potentially biasing the jury against Jason. The appeals court agreed with Jason's arguments. A unanimous panel of the Court of Appeals vacated his conviction and ordered a new trial, which would have been his third. However, before a third trial could take place, a state Court of Appeals panel reversed the Court of Appeals decision. Consequently, Jason did not face a third trial, and his conviction for first-degree murder stood. In the civil wrongful death suit, Michelle's family was awarded $15.5 million in damages. What do you think about this story? Share your opinions in the comments. Thanks for watching and for being with us. Take care of yourself and your loved ones.